sure is good to see all of you back tonight, especially some that don't always exercise that privilege, and I'd encourage you to keep doing that. Brother Billy Balky was here, and a lot of our members know him, but Brother Billy was a, an older preacher, and some time ago he came out, and he meant this complimentary. He said, man, that was a Sunday morning sermon. And I said, well, Billy, I strive. I may not always make it, but I strive to only preach Sunday morning sermons, by which I meant I try to pack something in there that's worthwhile and important because we do deal with eternity. And uh, there is, as Herschel mentioned in his prayer, there's nothing any more significant than being prepared for the time that we take our journey into the presence of the one who made us. Uh, I hope and pray and want it to be such that for everybody in this house, that that's a wondrous, joyous time. I want to talk to you tonight about subjectivism. And subjectivism is caught up in this passage in Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That sounds familiar to me. I don't know if it does to you or not. Uh, subjectivism is a thing that brings chaos wherever it goes because it denies the fact that there is an objective reality. You and I may have a disagreement sometimes, and uh, it, it may be polar opposite. Now, we could both be wrong, but we can't both be right at the same time, you know, holding opposite positions. And to argue for the idea that that is popular with subjectivism, and it is quite popular. People afflicted by that will, will confidently affirm, well, you know, I have your, my truth, and you're welcome to have your truth, and we both are right. That's an absurd statement to make. Suddenly, you find out that all that congeniality and, and cordial behavior, if you ever deal with these folks, is going to break down the first time you have a disagreement. And you see that, we see that portrayed on our television now, don't we? People shouting over each other, they don't listen to each other, they don't know what the other guy's talking about, nor do they care, they're just, uh, they're just convinced they're right, and they're right because they feel like they're right. And that's a, that's a sad state of affairs, it's a dangerous posture for any people to, to occupy and to take up. And, you know, suddenly, if you ever have to question something that they say, you are wrong, and branded as some variation of a, of a phobe, some kind of phobic. This phobic, that phobic, another phobic. Um, my personal experience with a lot of these folks, because I try to engage them and talk with them, and I'm friends with some of them, but my personal experience with them is that they are, they are cordial and polite unless you just, you pesky thing, you, you start raising questions about what to do or say something that challenges a position that they hold. As a group, I find them to be often wrong and never in doubt. There's some of them in the Congress, and that's a scary thought, but it's true. And this kind of thinking has always and will always result in anarchy. It'll result in chaos. An example of that, the best example I know of, is seen in the book of Judges, why anybody would want to occupy that ground that's ever read about that period of, of Jewish history is a mystery to me because it was a sad, sad period. A disturbing pattern developed among God's people during this period of time. It was about three centuries. They accepted during that time no standard of faith, no standard of conduct. It was just a free-for-all. In Judges 17 and 6, Judges 21 25, they say the same thing. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And as a result of that, a, a spiral of violence and immorality and cruelty relentlessly engulfed the whole society. And again and again, the Israelites were forced to endure the consequences of the choices that they'd made, and they were unpleasant consequences. You got to remember now when God brought the people to the land that he promised to them. They entered a polytheistic pagan culture. Integral to that culture, just a part and parcel of that culture, and their religion was the worship of nature 
the worship of, of creatures rather than the creator, temple prostitution, human sacrifice, and a number of other vulgarities that I won't talk about in a public setting like this. Israel entered this environment with a faith that rested on an entirely different foundation. Rather than worshiping multiple gods, Israel believed in the one true, all-powerful creator and sustainer, same God that we worship. The faith embraced by the Israelites embraced a highly moral lifestyle which grew out of their unique covenant relationship with Yahweh. Uh, as we observed initially in the beginning of the sermon, the period of the judges was a time of unprecedented anarchy. You know, there are folks that, that go around, they, they scrape enough money or bum, bum the money off their parents to get them a black T-shirt with a red a circle on it with a big red A in it. And, and it's supposed to say that they're for anarchy. They've never seen anarchy. Because if you take a lot of those little wimpy guys, if, if they ever were in a situation where there's anarchy, it, they are going to be one of the first targets. Nobody with any judgment wants to see that. And yet that's what the Jews brought themselves to. Their progressive moral religious decline is carefully cataloged in the scriptures in the book we know as the book of Judges. And the, the, this resulted when they allowed themselves to be surrounded by this Canaanite religion with its appeal to the flesh. And the conflict with Jehovah and the false gods grew more acute, more intense as the mixed marriages took place. So the mixed marriages now didn't have anything to do with ethnicity. It had nothing to do with race. It had to do with their religion. And God said, do not mix up with those folks. They did it anyway. In Judges chapter 1, we see that the Israelites didn't drive the Canaanites out as they'd been ordered to do. And to the contrary, they made treaties with them. They lived among them. They gave their sons and daughters to them in marriage. The Canaanites began to drive the Israelites out. In Judges 18, there is the record of the migration of the Danites, the tribe of Dan, showing the religious apostasy that underlies their failure to conquer the land that God gave them. The Canaanites came to have a fixed border. They're no longer hiding out in Israel like they had been because God gave the Israelites orders to get them out of there. Don't leave them in the land. Move them. And uh, they didn't do that. So now they've got their own territory. How could that be? How could that happen? Well, it happened because the Israelites ignored the divine instructions that they received from their God. In Judges 2, 1 and 2, now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I've sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this that you have done? Israel knew God's will. They very well understood his attitude towards the Canaanites. Yet they ignored that and made treaties with the pagans, and they paid for it thereafter. They forgot the mighty works that God had done for them. And, you know, you're astounded by that when you think about it. But Joshua 2, verse 7 and verse 10, respectively, tell us nevertheless that that's what happened. The first one, verse 7, says, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Oh, they knew better than not to. And all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. But you get down to verse 10, and it notes that all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. That is, they died and were buried. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. So compromise with evil is what killed the Israelites. That's what destroyed the kingdom. What sort of pattern do we see in North America coming close to the end of the first quarter of the 21st century? What do we see? 
an honest look across our land that I love and you love, a country consciously founded on biblical principles, and we see compared to Israel in the time of the judges disturbing similarities. Some of you will remember Dr. William J. Bennett. He was the Secretary of Education, and uh, he's a noted author and lecturer and, and professor. But he gathered some facts that he reported to, to the people, done in, or, or presented in the American Family Association Journal. This is way back in 1993. I find my, if my math is correct, I'm not very good at math, that's 29 years ago. But I want you to listen to just a few of those things that comes out of that research. And you tell me if things are any better today. In the early 1960s, the Census Bureau began to publish the Index of Economic Indicators. You've heard that on the news, whether you paid any attention to it or not. And there are 11 measurements that taken together are supposed to represent the best means that we have to predict trends in the economy. Well, they also began to gather a leading cultural indicators uh, picture. And it's, it's a data-based analysis of cultural issues. And it presents a statistical portrait from 1960 to 1993. And they look at the moral, social, behavioral conditions extant in the American society. From 1960 to 1993, the U.S. population increased to 41%. It's increased a lot more since then. The gross domestic product uh, nearly tripled. Total social spending at all levels of government rose from $143 billion to over a trillion annually. Spending on welfare increased 630%, while spending on education 225%. Violent crime rose 560%. During this time, uh, uh, illegitimate birth rolls, 419%. Divorce quadruple. Children living in single-parent households triple. There was more than 200% increase in teen suicides. So with all of that help, you bought a, a dramatic rise in the social ills that we're still dealing with. And everybody know, in this house knows that those social ills show no sign of abatement, none whatsoever. These results, ladies and gentlemen, did not come because some daddy had enough gumption to tell his kids to get up on Sunday morning, get ready, and, and come with him to the Bible class to worship. It, it is not the result of him insisting that they learn a single memory verse in a week. That's not what caused that problem. Not at all. The powers exercised by institutions of social order have been constrained in many instances, particularly that exercised by the churches. And as a result, the people from the halls of academia to the halls of Congress to the religious establishment across Christendom in many instances, if not most instances, embrace a lifestyle that values self-expression over self-control. There used to be a time when we emphasized to moderate one's habits and moderate one's words and moderate one's activities. Now, who is to blame for all that anarchy that we saw in Israel? And then we'll come and ask the same question about the contemporary American society. Certainly, the parents of the Israelite children bore a large portion of the blame for what took place in that country. For after all, children do what they see. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 says, All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. We read that just a moment ago. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. How was that? How could that come to be? That could only occur as a result of a conscious choice on the part of the adults. They neglected their duty to their own children. The parents were not lacking in instruction about how to proceed in raising up children, uh, a generation of faithful children, to take their place. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, Moses writing, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets, uh, frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. If God's law had in fact been written on their hearts as a result of continual reading and study and teaching, Israel could not have forgotten. It had been physically impossible to have forgotten. But their parents chose not to follow God's instructions. That's why they weren't taught, and that's why they weren't in the synagogues when they should have been. Israel's parents were not alone in the failure to raise up a new generation faithful to God. The priest, the religious leadership during that time, bears a great deal of responsibility for the deplorable conditions that came to exist among God's people. Israel's spiritual leaders were a, just an absolute failure. A false sanctuary was erected, accompanied by a false priesthood in Judges chapter 17 and 18. If you look over chapter 18, verses 30 and 31, it says the sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's graven image, which he had made all the time that the house of God was at Shiloh. So instead of keeping the faith, the Levites prostituted themselves and disgraced the law of God. They hired themselves out to a lie, and they had to know it was a lie. Instead of seeking God's guidance, the leaders sought, the religious leaders sought the guidance of false teachers in Judges 18. You come to chapter 19, and the leadership of the nation did absolutely nothing to curtail that kind of activity. They didn't do a thing about it. And so the message to Israel was clear. You know, they should have been giving birth to all manner of good works to God's glory. They should have been dynamic and vigorous in things that are honorable and righteous and good, and they were not. Instead, they're playing the harlot and dying as a result of it. Had Israel's leaders sounded forth the law of God in every place, they would they would have been an honorable and safe place to live and raise a family, a clean place to live, rather than the den of iniquity that it became. They should have been guarding God's people, that is the religious, religious leadership, but they were not, and anarchy was a result. Why? Por qué? Uh, probably because somebody was saying, well, now if you say that, Billy Bob's going to get mad. If you should, man, if you utter that truth, Sally Francis is not going to like it. And so you better not do it, at least not in the pulpit, and don't do it in the classroom. So where are you going to speak the truth? I've asked that question for a long time from, uh, from people that were hesitant to speak the truth in a clear way, and they've never been able to give me a cogent answer. They should have been guarding God's people. Whenever God's word is not taught and whenever God's word is not preached, ruination and destruction are sure to follow. That's why you hear me just like a broke record player saying this is what you get when you turn your back on God. Shouldn't be a shock to anybody. Who is responsible for the current conditions in so many congregations of the Lord's people? Who did that? But now, as in ancient Israel, if you're just going to be honest and lay it right out on the table, that's what I intend to do, it's parents largely. And it's always been. God's directives are clear in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I shall never forget hearing a fellow ask one time, are you, are you a Christian? No, but my wife is. No, but my wife is. And his wife did the best that, that she could, but he was, he was A-W-O-L. He was absent without leave because God didn't assign that job to his wife. God assigned it to him. Anyone whose eyes are open sees an alarming number of young people not only drifting from the old past, they're running from it. Backed up like a crawdad on, on, uh, on alert. But Jeremiah chapter 6 verses 15 through 19 reads like this. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They didn't even know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time that I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand by the old ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And I set a watchman over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. We read that this morning. Reading it again tonight because I want us to get it. But they said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words. As for my law, they have rejected it also. It's time, it's been time, it's past time that parents take a stand in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I know we're not a covenant people with God like ancient Israel was, but we have been a highly favored nation, I believe because of the biblical principles upon which the nation was founded. And when you back away from that, there's going to bring consequences. Mothers and fathers have a divinely ordained role to play. Parents today got to stand and take, assume that role. We can ill afford to entrust the fate of our precious children to a bunch of government bureaucrats. One thing that was good that came out of the pandemic is the parents began to look at the curricula that the students have been exposed to, and they were horrified. My question would be, well, why weren't you looking at it before now? We cannot afford that. We, we pay for the public schools, ladies and gentlemen. You pay for them. We pay for the universities in this state. And we should demand a sensible, sane environment with an emphasis on the classical core subjects and academic rigor should characterize that program. You keep people busy enough to stay out of trouble. Joshua knew how to make a choice for his household. Joshua knew how to be a man of God. For in Joshua 24 and verse 15, you're familiar with the passage. If it is disagreeable, he says to the Israelites, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you'll serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were beyond the Jordan or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And because of Joshua's stalwart stance, Israel remained faithful as long as he lived and the elders that he influenced lived. The Lord chose Abraham partly because of his willingness to lead his family in God's service, to be the man. Genesis 18 and verse 19. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he's spoken about him. Christian families today, is, I don't need to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway, they are in disarray across many communities. Instead of serving as a beacon of hope to a beleaguered world, many of our families are chasing popularity among unbelievers. Let me speak with clarity. Let's put it down on the bottom shelf. Christian parents, in far too many cases, are not only allowing but encouraging their sons and their daughters to speak like, to dress like, and to act like the children of the devil. Just as you can't sleep in a barn full of goats without coming out smelling like a goat, 
You can't run with a bunch of heathens and not be tainted by those individuals. Just because an activity is sponsored by the school or sponsored by some other government entity, it does not mean that it's consistent with biblical teaching or that you ought to allow your own children to participate in it. We have to make some demands of our children. We have to make some demands of our school boards. We have to make demands of our school administrators and our law enforcement agencies, all of which we pay for, brethren. We're part of the community. Our money's green just like everybody else's is. The hour's late and the day is far spent. It is time, it is past time that Christian men find their voice, assert their authority in their own families and in the community in every honorable way. Too many of our youngsters have learned to be rebellious against the law of God because they act like their mom and daddy. And I don't like to say that. It's hurtful to say it. What are we to do? Well, we need to begin, each of us, loving the Lord God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul, all of our strength. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus quotes a passage we just read from the Old Testament. Verse 36, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? We looked at that this morning. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So we begin there by devoting ourselves and dedicating ourselves. If we make a covenant with the Lord, we need to keep it. We need to, he'll keep his end. You can be assured of that, and we need to keep ours. And we need to resolve that we're not going to forsake the assembling of uh, ourselves together, and we're not going to forsake the assemblies of worship, the assemblies for study, in deference to some secular activity. You know, it would be different. We understand sometimes, you know, you may be on the way and see somebody injured on the side of the road and have a chance to stop and help, and you should do that. Of course you should do that. But there are too many mundane pedestrian things of this world that pull people out of the worship service when they should be there. And I've watched them go right out that back door when parents take that, that approach. They've watched it so much I can't hardly stand it. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 27, he says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing nigh. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Jesus paid it all. There's nothing else to give but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a furnace of fire which will consume the adversary's parents, determine that you will have your children in the assemblies of the saints every time that it takes place. You be here and you have your babies in tow. Children will ultimately do what they say. I mean, and be happy about it. Don't be mad that you're having to go. And don't make it an unpleasant experience. Be happy about it and have them with you, and they'll be happy too. Too many of our youngsters have rebelled against the law of God because they see that. And so we urge people not to do that. And if every worldly, if every worldly activity takes presence, or precedent, I should say, over the activities of the church at your house, then the children are highly likely to deem attendance as a subject of no real consequence. If you allow the Little League and other extra extracurricular activities to take precedent over faithful service in the kingdom, then do not be as shocked when they abandon the faith. Parents have a responsibility. It's a grave responsibility. I shall never forget when that nurse laid Devana in my arms, a little old thing, and you had to look in there to find somebody. It didn't weigh enough to hardly feel. But I looked at that little face going from the delivery room to the nursery, and my knees got weak. Because it became apparent to me in a very powerful way that the good Lord 
has blessed you, brother, and she's, he's going to hold you accountable for that little girl. And you better do your job. And I've tried to do that. Religious leaders today are also to blame. Preachers of today stand in the place of the Levites in that they are the ones that are charged with the responsibility of teaching God's will. 2 Timothy 2, 2 and 3. The things Paul writes to Timothy that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these two faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. That's their job. Their divine mission is clearly stated as well as the reason for it. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside the myth. But you be sober in all things and do hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The preacher's function is not to be a political hack who constantly courts personal popularity. He ought to be a approachable and a kind-hearted person. He must be that man. And nevertheless, it's not his job at all to cater to the whims of, of people that are just cranky and hard to get along with and don't like some of the things that God said. That's not my problem. The preacher's function is to declare the truth with clarity from a loving heart. In Ephesians 4 and verse 15, Paul said, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in him in all aspects who is the head, even Christ. But we are to speak it. It is hurtful to say this, but prominent preachers and professors, in some cases presidents of some of our schools, are failing to stand in the gap and boldly assert the primacy of the Word of God and declaring without favor and without apology that it is the mind of God revealed and will all face it in judgment. They won't say it. And that is precisely why we have denominational concepts and practices creeping into, galloping in some cases, into once faithful congregations. People who say, well, we fasted and we prayed and we studied and, and we think it's all right to have instruments of music. The Bible had changed, brother. God still said sing. And there's not anything really hard about that if you want to do what the Lord said to do. And that same group of people have, have decided that what we need to do, too, is put the ladies in the pulpit. I respect women. You can ask my wife if I don't respect women. And I have a high regard for their capabilities. I help to train one that's a physician. So obviously, I don't have a hang-up about women being in responsible positions. But we, got to, we must respect the words of God and where he places restrictions and gives assignments that must be respected will we wring our hands about some of the things that i've delineated tonight will we just wring our hands about that and complain or will we act decisively i say we act decisively i say that we to the degree that we can make sure that we just man up and do our job and that we find the courage to refuse error that we preach the truth, preach it from a loving heart, but preach it without apology, none whatsoever. We must not follow Israel's path in the day of the judges. We've seen that movie, and the end was most unpleasant. We must stand upon God's word, and only on God's word is our rule of faith and practice in this place of worship and everywhere else that we chance to be. What's wrong with that? People out here in these other religious groups, they can contend for what they believe and nobody fusses about it, so why should we be restricted? We've restricted ourselves. We've restricted ourselves. Nobody in the Baptist church has tried to restrict me or any of the rest of them. 
we find ourselves sometimes not in agreement, but they've not tried to restrict me. I don't know what the bureaucrats are going to do, but I'm not worried about the religious community. Let's be God's people or no people at all. If you're here tonight and you are estranged from his majesty or if there's something that, that needs to be corrected, correct it, please. And if we can help you in doing that by going into the presence of God in prayer, we'd be honored to do it. It will always make it available for someone to obey the gospel of Christ. If you've not yet taken that step, you may not get another opportunity like this. I've had that happen two or three times that I can remember in my ministry where I said we may not all ever be together again and between the morning and the evening service somebody was gone. Life is fleeting. Don't be careless with it, please. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ and have not done so, repent and turn away from sin and confess the Lord and come be buried with him in baptism. Rise up to walk in the new life and be what he calls us to be. Live as he directs. And in the after a while, he'll take us home to be with him. If we can help you, won't you come? Together we stand and sing.